everybody. Today I am revisiting a performance car legend, the R35 Nissan GTR. Now, without question, there is and always has been place for a Bayside Blue R34 Skyline GTR in my money no object dream garage. However, when the R35 launched, I really didn't like it at all, and, and I mean, I, I seriously did not like the car. I looked at it and went, ugh, what have they done? I didn't like the fact that the Skyline name had been dropped, although that didn't bug me massively. I just didn't understand it. I didn't get it. I didn't like it. However, a few years later, and the looks began to grow on me a, a little bit, and more importantly, I got the opportunity to drive one, and that changed everything. Because then I really started to appreciate the car. Now it's hard to believe, but this car was actually unleashed on the world in 2007, 13 years ago, and you can still buy one. Now back when they were new, they were not just a performance car, but they were a performance car bargain. They cost less than £60,000 when they were brand new, and had the firepower and technology to give both Ferrari and Porsche a bloody nose. McLaren, of course, weren't even around back then. Not in the way that they are now. However, time is a very cruel mistress, and soon all of Nissan's rivals managed to match and then beat the GTI in terms of power, they had some good dust-ups at the Nürburgring, and eventually the Nissan seemed to be, well, almost a little bit forgotten. Doesn't help that it's a lot more expensive than it used to be. Where you could pick up a new one of these for about 55 to 60,000 quid once upon a time, now you're talking about 90,000 pounds. That's not including some of the special editions that they've made, including the Nismo, which was about 50 or 60 percent more again. And if you wanted the in attack pack, well, be prepared for a shock, because if you really wanted the same car that went round the Nürburgring in that record time, you're probably going to have dropped about a quarter of a million pounds all told. So these aren't really as cheap as they used to be. However, in 2017, for the GTR's 10th birthday, Nissan decided to give the old girl a bit of a spruce up and addressed a few things that have been raised as key issues during the GTR's life. Namely, the fact that it never really felt quite as premium as a lot of people wanted it to, and it was a bit of a tough riding so-and-so as well. So, amongst the changes introduced for the 2017 model year were the much nicer interior, and I have to say, seeing it today in the flesh for the first time, it really has worked. This is a much much nicer place to be. In fact, the button count in here was more than half, going from about 27 down to 11, making this a much more streamlined and just better looking thing. Of course, you've still got the old familiar graphics, but they all seem just a little bit fresher, a little bit slicker, and a little bit nicer. This soft leather in the door is really actually quite nice, and in this particular car you have red stitching all over the place too. Up ahead, you had a few minor changes to the engine and engine management system, giving this car a total of 570 horsepower out of the box. Now, this car, of course, being a GTR, isn't entirely standard, having a Y pipe fitted, but that's about it. And that is there in this car simply for a slightly nicer noise. It's going to be interesting driving this car too, because the last one that I drove, despite being a very early car, also put out about the same amount of power. Perhaps the most significant change for a lot of people was that in the suspension department. You see, Nissan made this car ride, in their words, quite a bit better. It's still firm if you're expecting Rolls-Royce levels of plushness, please look elsewhere. However, it's certainly an improvement over the old car. I've got it in comfort mode currently, the transmission is in R, the traction control is in standard, and we have a sublime road to enjoy. So let's do that, shall we?
large gearbox. A very early example of the technology is definitely slicker than it used to be. And the engine has a much broader spread of power. It pulls really hard, really smoothly, all the way to the red line. And despite the model's advancing years, this is still an incredibly engaging, exciting, and very quick car. It's also quite big, and it is taking up a lot of road here. Yes, I know I've positioned myself in the middle of it. That's because there's a nasty looking guardrail there. Now, steering in the GTR is actually a very good talking point because it's not awful. It's not the best thing I've ever experienced. But actually, it reminds me in some ways of my old Lotus Evora. There's a lightness to it, but also a keenness to turn. It's very intuitive and this big old boat always felt a lot more engaging than you thought it should have. I must say I really am a fan of the later looks. I know there's a lot who prefer the sort of pure styling of the earlier cars. These ones are quite heavily influenced by the first gen Nismo, but I think this sharper look really works for the GTR and this Katsura orange shade, which was the signature colour for the 2017 vehicles, is magnificent. Uh, this particular car, incidentally, has been kept clean by Blackbeard's detailing, and um, he's done a rather good job, because in the sunlight, it absolutely shines. The GTR is a mighty weapon. Now you get to a certain speed and you can feel the weight of the car. 1.7 tons or thereabouts and ultimately there is no hiding it. Now the GTR is a car which does its best to ignore physics. I've been down some country roads in these things absolutely, completely, 100% certain that death was waiting for me personally with a red carpet at each corner. And yet somehow, every single bend, Death was left rather disappointed because the GTR stuck two fingers up, went and just went round the corner, no trouble whatsoever. It really is a remarkable machine. But anybody who calls this thing a computer on wheels, shame on you, sir, because it really isn't. And trust me, I could get this very very wrong if I wanted to. It's not a car where you can simply just stick it around a corner, put your boots in and hope everything will be fine. Absolutely not. And to ignore the amount of technology in more ordinary or perhaps analogue cars now would be foolish. The amount of trickery going on under the skin of something like a McLaren is unbelievable. Those cars are just surreal. In many ways the GTR is rather more mechanical. Now, living with a GTR isn't the easiest. They're reasonably practical. I'd call it a sort of two plus one seater, depending on how tall the driver and passenger are. And there's actually quite a bit of room in the boot, although the load lip is very high. However, these are thirsty if you're enjoying yourself. Actually, very thirsty if you're enjoying yourself. Merely sort of uh, a bit parched when you're just driving normally. They are large, so if you have to drive them through tight spaces, part of the city, all that sort of stuff, probably not the best. And running costs for them are high. Believe most things you've heard. They can have issues, brakes and whatnot, they will chew through just for fun, and they're not particularly cheap. If you want to take this car on track, you are going to go through consumables at a terrifying rate. In all honesty, I think a GTR is a much better road than track car. And the 2017 GTR is an excellent road car. This really flows, and as long as you know its limits, and it will tell you, because it'll get out of shape fast, it's really rather something. And just to prove a point, I'm going to stick the suspension straight into R mode, just to see if it's improved things. The pace this thing gathers is unbelievable. doesn't give you masses of feedback, but the car just responds. It feels like an extraordinarily well-trained Doberman, this thing. 
you know, it could bite your face off, yet somehow it doesn't. There's a little bit more body control in the corners with the suspension in R mode, although if I'm being honest, the difference between the two doesn't feel as night and day as it does in some other cars. When you're going over the potholes, you certainly can feel a difference. But this is a car you can really use the mid-range if you like, top end if you so desire. And actually, contrary to popular belief, you don't need to thrash a GTR to have fun. Sure, that is probably what it's absolutely best at, but you can really get into a rhythm with it. There are a few weak points. These paddles don't feel as mechanical as I'd like them to. The aforementioned high running costs, and the fact that because people do rather like these later cars, you're still gonna have to pay the best part of 60,000 pounds to get in one. If you're looking at a GTR as an occasional blast, I'm sure an earlier one would do you just fine. However, if you want something to live with, the later cars really are better. And I have to say, every time I drive a GTR, I like it that little bit more. And if I was gonna buy one, I think it would have to be one of these. And in all honesty, I know they are the tuner's darling. I know Ricky is going off doing crazy things with his, but I'm a different character to Ricky. There's plenty of space in this world for the both of us. Me, I'd leave mine just as it is. Stealthy enough to enjoy without upsetting absolutely everybody. It looks marvelous and it is a lot of fun and has earned its place in my mind and in my heart as a real Japanese performance legend. One day I will have my R34. Oh yes, it will be mine. And maybe there'll be space alongside it for an R35. Maybe this will live outside. We'll see. Anyway, thanks all for watching. Please like, comment below. Make sure to check out Marco's Instagram for the car. I'll put the uh, link to that here and in the description below. We'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.